Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the Rhode Island State Legislature Representative Forum. My name is Lynn Tungit. I'm the editor and publisher of Newport This Week, and I'd like to view welcome our viewers to the forum tonight. You will be hearing from four of our island representatives. Tonight we have Marvin Abney from District 73, Lauren Carson from District 75, John J. Edwards representing District 70, and Deborah Gero from District 74. On January 31st, East Bay Newspapers and editor Scott Pickering will host a forum for the other legislators in Portsmouth, Tiverton, Little Compton, Lou De Palma, Don Oyer, and Terry Cortrevan, who are joining that group due to a state house scheduling conflict. This forum is a collaboration between the Newport County chapter of League of Women Voters in Newport this week. The purpose of the collaboration is to give an informal update for Newport County voters on issues facing our state and community. I'd like to point out that the League of Women Voters and Newport this week are nonpartisan and do not endorse candidates. Tonight's questions have been prepared by the Newport League of Women Voters. At this time, I would like to introduce Jill Cassis, the president of the Newport County chapter of League of Women Voters. Jill, un unmute yourself. J Jill, un unmute it. How's there you it? go. <laughs> uh, my my unmuting skills are not too great, apparently. <laughs> but it's um, it, it, this is a wonderful collaboration and. Um, the information that we're going to be receiving tonight and uh, in other forums is so important in these times, especially this year and beyond. So um, we, uh, we're very excited about this and we look forward to hearing from everybody. Thank you, Jill. Susan Wells, a member of the League of Women Voters and her husband, Rogers, Roger, will be timing the opening and closing statements and responses to the six questions being asked. One will operate a stopwatch and the other will display colored cards. A yellow card is going to indicate the speaker has 15 seconds remaining and a red card indicates the time has expired. Um, because of the time limitations, we will um, put speakers on mute if need be. <laughs> Just to give our viewers an overview of tonight's uh, forum, the representatives will be going in alphabetical order, starting with uh, Representative Abney, and they will be giving 90 seconds for opening statements, and then the series of questions following the opening statements, 90 seconds to respond, and then the final portion tonight is 90 seconds for closing statements uh, where the representatives can expand on anything that was mentioned tonight or uh, ask a question of another, of another representative. So let me begin with the, uh, with the first question is going to go to Marvin Abney. Oh, pardon me. The statements, opening statements. <laughs> we'll put a little tile up on the screen showing what the uh, question topics are for our readers. But yes, opening statements, Mr. <laughs> Abney. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. In fact, I forgot my opening statement, so we can just go on to the next one. But <laughs> no, uh, thanks for the opportunity to be with my colleagues uh, this afternoon, this evening, uh, and yourself. This is so important to get a chance to uh, let people know where we are coming from on things we do. But more, more than that, it's always important to have a chance to talk to people other than to those that we see in the State House every day uh, about the issues that affect them. After all, we're just representatives who, in our job, we represent uh, the thoughts and the hearts of a lot of our constituents. And so having forums like this gives us a chance to kind of weave 
a lot of our priorities into uh, what you're asking. So I simply look forward to the discussion we're going to have. It's important, it's critical. This is a very, very difficult time we're going through challenging. But I think if we talk to each other, learn what we need, we can get a lot of things done. So I'm just glad to be here doing that. Thank you. Lauren? Yes, thank you very much, Lynn. I, I guess I wanna echo what my colleague, Chairman Abney has said that, you know, I personally enjoy uh, speaking to the public, engaging them in the conversation and hearing, and hearing these questions and answering them for everyone. Uh, I think that we're at a very, you know, this is my eighth year that I'm in right now. And we're at a very interesting juncture point uh, in Rhode Island, as well as in this country. COVID is still raging. Uh, we're, we, we are meeting under some extreme circumstances in the House of Representatives. Our schedule is not 100%. We've only been meeting once or twice a week. Uh, we have hundreds of millions of dollars that have come into the state as the result of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So we have a lot of challenges, but we have a lot of opportunities. And so I think that this is really an important time to be having conversations like this. I thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions. Welcome. Jay Edwards? Uh, again, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to speak to our communities. Um, as we all know, the, the last two years have, have been incredibly uh, challenging for the entire state, the entire nation. Um, last year's House session was incredibly productive. In fact, we, we passed basically two years worth of legislation in, in just six months. Uh, we were able to achieve pay equity. We were able to work towards a $15 minimum wage. Uh, we tackled affordable housing like no other General Assembly has in the history. Uh, we created a permanent funding stream and how, for, for housing and housing production. Uh, we addressed discrimination in housing, and we initiated a more supportive and permanent housing program to assist the homeless and created a, a, basically a housing czar to coordinate all, the, all these efforts. Um, we also addressed critical uh, climate change. And we passed probably one of the most important and decisive environmental bills in decades. We also passed something I'm extremely proud of. We passed uh, harm reduction centers, which will allow people who have substance abuse issues to go to a place and safely use their own drugs and not die from overdoses. We were the first in the country to do this. And we look forward to getting the, the, our pilot program up and ready for the state of Rhode Island. Thank you, As, Jay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you for uh, inviting me and thank you to the we League of Women Voters for all the work you do around so many policy issues. I'm really honored to serve as a state rep for District 74, Middletown and Jamestown with my esteemed colleagues. Many of them have touched upon some of the most important points uh, that we have before for us. Some of the issues that you know keep me up at night, uh, the first one, of course, is the pandemic. We may be COVID fatigued, but the virus is not. So the year ahead of us will focus again on health and economic uh, related issues. Um, I believe how the state invests the $1.1 billion of federal money over the next several years is critically important. You know, honored to serve on House Finance uh, with my colleagues and um, chair the House Innovation and Technology Committee, as well as the CRMC Study Commission, which has really been doing some work on recommending how we navigate the CRMC's mission, protecting, preserving, and developing the state's 420 miles of coastline. So we'll look at the balance of that in the year ahead. And the fast, affordable, you've heard me say it, reliable internet broadband. You know, the feds have made this a priority in their budgets and have said every single state now must have a strategic plan on how we're going to get broadband uh, to unserved and undisturbed. And it's critically important how Rhode Island connects the 14% of folks that we have unserved and 42% of Rhode Island's that are underserved, including many people on Aquidneck Island. So, you know, how we use these funds is really important. So I look forward to a broadband advisory council, which I've been sponsoring, uh, so that we actually have some oversight and transparency. Thank you very much for everyone's uh, very informative opening statements. As we go on through the evening, um, maybe jot down some notes for yourself and your closing statements can be even more informative. Great. All right, now we'll go to the first question. 
<laughs> and we'll start with Marvin for this uh, first question. And then the second question will go to Lauren and so on through the, uh, through the group. So the first question prepared by the League of Women Voters is, what changes could you suggest to the Rhode Island legislature's rules that would allow committees more control over which bills get floor votes? Currently, many good bills and legislative initiatives that deserve discussion and votes in the full bodies never reach the floor. Marvin, can we start with you to make a comment on that uh, question? Yeah, you sure can. Uh, and I appreciate that. that. That's a great question. It's a, it's a great comment. Uh, when I first saw it, I was trying to, in my own mind, get into the mind of who, of, of what the person re was really looking for. Maybe what you don't know is that at the beginning of every year, I believe my colleagues can correct me, uh, we do have a, a rules committee that uh, set up the policies that, we, that we're going to operate on during, during the year. Uh, and if we needed to make any changes, it would be in that. But, but I don't know that, uh, that what we do is any different from a lot of the other legislatures that I see. Because we are a part-time legislature, uh, we don't have the luxury of having an entire year to hear every single bill that comes forward. And I know every single bill is important to the person who puts it in. Uh, but what we do do uh, is we take, the, what, one of the rules that we changed was that if you had a bill, for example, that did not make the floor this year, uh, you don't have to leap through a lot of hoops and bounds to get it on the floor the next year. Again, I think what a lot of people really don't know is that a lot of the bills that are passed, uh, they are bills that have been introduced three, four, five years down the line. Now, that doesn't stop a bill from being a good bill, but I don't know that the system that we are working under now is that bad in order to get a, a good bill to the floor, because most of them really are heard uh, in, their, in their respective committees. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin. Lauren? Yeah, I, um, I wanted to say that it's not only the rules that dictate the way the rooms operate, it's also the culture in the rooms. And uh, uh, we have a terrific speaker now who has really changed the culture in the room and has opened it up. Members feel more inclusive. There's more dialogue. The committees are more productive. And I think that we're with under Joe Shikarchi's leadership, we're actually living the rules a little bit better than we had been under previous speakers. And I'm really happy about that, as a matter of fact. Um, also, we, we need the committees to be deliberative, right? So having the bills in the committee is really the place that the debate should take place. I'm going to uh, credit my colleague, Representative Cortvan, for her idea. She, and she, you'll hear about this from her next week. She has suggested that a lot of bills go before finance. And sometimes they have a lot of content, say related to education, but they have a price tag approached. And Terry's been incubating the idea, and I'm supporting it, of really having if the bill can go through two committees. Like if the content can go through the committee where the content can be debated and then maybe you could go to finance. And I, I think Terry's onto something and I would encourage you to talk to her about that next week. That way we could really make sure we're flushing out more content as we decide how to spend our money. Very good. Next week, the uh, representatives will be answering the same questions. So hopefully our viewers will tune in and hear what she has to say. Jay? And Mr. thank you. Edwards? Yes, I, I think that Lauren and, and uh, Marvin are correct. The uh, with the current speaker we have, the process has opened up and become a lot more transparent. And both uh, Marvin and Deb are committee chairs, so they know that they have a lot more control under this particular leadership team than they did in previous teams. Uh, the speaker, the speaker, has allowed the chair people to uh, give more input. And if a bill has a lot of support in committee and the chairperson thinks that it's, uh, it's an important bill, the bill has a much more, much more uh, stronger ch uh, chance of actually making it to the floor. One of the things I've consistently said is that if a bill is, is drafted, sometimes they're not drafted well. So we hold them for further study, myself included. A lot of people have drafted bills and they get held because they need work. They need to be fixed or they need to be put into a new, new section of the law so not all bills that are drafted are perfect. And it gives us the opportunity to go in with our legal teams and correct them. Mm. 
Very good. Deb, your turn. Yes, thank you. And the great thing about following all of my very articulate colleagues is they hit all of the high notes. Uh, there's no doubt the work happens in the committees and that's where it should happen with any legislation because that's also where the public comes in. And the most important part of any legislation is the input by the public. You know, the people can say what they like or what they don't like about a bill. And that's really important. And to Jay's point, a lot of bills really are not drafted well. As a part-time legislature, we don't have staff. So it's not like there's a lot of research that goes in. I know for myself, I just spend, and some of my colleagues do as well, we spend hours and months and months of research and working on bills but not all colleagues, you know, do that. You know, we, we some of them work very full time jobs. So, as a result, the committee process is really critical. Um, there was, you know, a couple of rule changes that we did get through, and one that is very important is the forty eight hour notice on any amendments. That's really critical because every legislator should be able to read a bill before they vote on it, and so should the public. You know, they should see what bills were passing. So that was an important bill uh, rule that came through, um, not 2019. And again, under Speaker Shikarchi, it's just a whole different vibe there um, as far as bills and what happened. So thank you for that question. Thank you all for your informative answers. Our second question will start with Lauren. What specific steps to control greenhouse gases can realistically be passed in the upcoming session? Would you sponsor such a legislation? I got to tell you, Lynn, that's a real softball question to me, considering I was the sponsor of the Act on Climate. Um, and I can tell you that I'm spending at least a day, a day a week monitoring the implementation of the Act on Climate. And uh, my observations at this, at this time, and we're very early in the session, is that everyone has a lot of ideas about how to implement Act on Climate, and that's terrific. I mean, there's three big places where you want to uh, curb emissions, and that's in buildings, through transportation, or, th or through electrification. And many of my colleagues are working on a lot of bills relative to those issues. I'm asking to co-sponsor absolutely every one of them. But the that work that I'm putting in on implementation of Act on Climate is really working with DEM to see that what was in the law that we passed is actually beginning and that the, the EC4, or the Executive Climate Change Coordinating Council has the uh, resources it needs to implement Act on Climate uh, so that we're getting out to the public and we're explaining to the public how this law is gonna work over the next 28 years. Uh, there's a lot to do to implement Act on Climate. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm on board with all the bills. I think we're going to see some bills related to new buildings. I think we're going to, and how to curb emissions from them. I think we're going to see bills on some transportation issues. Uh, you know, we still have some issues here on this island with grid and trying to get folks on this island to, to uh, change over to heat pumps. So there's a lot to do in a lot of areas. And I'm very optimistic that over the next two to three years, we're going to have a very focused and very specific plan about reducing emissions. Thank you very much. Jay, your turn. Um, this is a real softball for me as well. In my day job, I am a, a construction manager and I'm also a lead accredited professional. And one of the things I am working with, Lauren already teed it up, is I'm working with Representative Kislak on revising the building codes to make our buildings not only more efficient, but to curb things like the fossil fuels going into them. The, one of the major contributors to our landfills is construction debris, mostly from demolition. 90% of our, our debris is from demolition debris. And we need to limit, we need to recycle, we need to reuse that debris coming out to limit it going into our landfills and also limit the amount of natural resources that are required to replace those items. We have things like almost all the steel in this country right now is recycled. Oh, we're starting to recycle wood. We're starting to recycle gypsum. There is a lot of work in recycling and reusing materials. So that's going to be my, my focus this year, working with uh, Representative Kislak to get this out and hope, hopefully contributing more uh, from the construction industry. Thank you. Deb? Thank you. Yes, like my colleagues, I've been a real advocate for a number of the renewable energy laws. 
And we do have to recognize uh, the significance of the Rhode Island legislature passing the act on climate last session. You know, we've all seen the impact of sea level rise and climate change and coastal erosion. It's all part of our economy, um, our environment and our infrastructure. I think the second most important environmental bill that we will pass hopefully this legislative session is the renewable energy standard. And this bill extends the current law that electric distribution companies must buy a percentage of retail electricity from renewables. It's a policy decision that the state made way back in 2004 before any of us were even there. Um, and it's a concept that if the standard is 50% and your electric company sells 100 megawatts, then they have to buy renewable energy credits in paper money that is traded all along New England. So it's not 100% renewables, but it certainly is credits to incentivize projects being built and getting away from fossil fuels. So I think that's an important um, piece of legislation that hopefully uh, will pass this year, because at the end of the day, you know, what's our environmental legacy that we leave behind for the generations that are gonna come right after us? And I think that's what many of us care deeply about. So thank you for the question. You're welcome. Marvin? Again, yeah, thanks for Thanks the question. Steve. And I, I agree with Deb that it's always great to follow a lot of your learned colleagues. Uh, <laughs> I, I am not an expert in this, but from a 30,000 foot perspective, I think it's, it's three things that, that concern me about the question. One is that, you know, how do you get, we know what we should do, but the question becomes, how do we change behavior to get that to happen? And one way, uh, obviously, is is finding that sweet spot of what can what can we do to incentivize companies, people, cities, towns to understand what you know what this does to our, our planet, and then from that uh, begin to to have goals that will will get you toward where you're trying to go. So incentives are one thing that I think uh, work. Where I I steer a little bit off is that I'm not sure how how much punishment works. In some of the states, uh, some of the laws will punish people for not doing X, Y, or Z. Uh, and I'm not sure that, that that causes behavioral change that we need to have in order to get the bills through like we've done here uh, in Rhode Island. And then you have to have goals that uh, has been said that are reasonable goals, they are achievable, but they're, but they're, they're long-term is something you can work towards. So, for me, uh, incentivizing companies, people to do the right thing is, is a way to go, and we have to figure out what that is. And then number two, have, have attainable goals that we can get to understand that each day we have to do this to get there. And I think that that's uh, very helpful. Thank you all again. Thank you. Our third question is going to go to uh, Jay Edwards from District 70. Will you support enshrining the steps to make voting easier employed during the last election permanent? This would include excuse free mail, free mail ballots and dropping the notary or two signature requirements and early days for voting with some weekend hours. An emphatic yes. Mm -hmm. I am one of the few members in the General Assembly still there who actually voted against voter ID. I don't believe there is, there should be any bar to voting. I think what the motor voter is incredible. I think we need to get more people involved. I know there's a question later on, but I think that the more that people are involved, the more they'll they'll actually own what's going on and become, become more active and help us as representatives to, to mend the divide that we currently we currently face, and I think that any any chance we have to make voting easier is a great opportunity for the state. Thank you, Jay. Deb, we'll go to you next. Okay, thank you, Lynn. 
And yes, I emphatically agree. I'm a co-sponsor of the Let Rhode Island Vote Bill. And because Jay and I came in about the same year in the same class, I also was um, one of the few who voted against voter ID. It seemed to be a solution to a problem that just didn't exist. But the Let Rhode Island Vote Bill um, really does a lot of what your question asked and more. You know, it mandates that the Secretary of State updates the Rhode Island voter list at least four times a year which is really important instead of this every odd number year that we do now. Um, it establishes a voter information hotline, polling places, registration for voters, and all of that in multiple languages. So it's really, really important that we make voting easy for people because we do not cast ballots for ourselves. We're casting ballots and voting for our collective future. So that's why the work that the League of Women Voters does, it's so important. You know, I'm going to quote Susan B. Anthony, someone struggled for your right to vote, use it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Marvin next. You have to unmute yourself there, Marvin. Try again. There you go. There there you go. go. Okay. There's absolutely no excuse or reason why we should have unreasonable impediments to a person to vote. That is what this country is based upon. Just from my own personal experience of growing up in the South in Texas and understanding and listening to my grandfather uh, who could not vote, uh, that's when you know uh, that, that something wasn't right then and it's not right now. Uh, voting should be safe, obviously, but voting should be easy. I, I was part of a group that went to uh, Switzerland and two or three other countries two years ago to watch uh, some of the parliamentary elections in Europe. And they make it so much easier for people to participate. And you know there are people who've, who've died because they could not get to the polls to vote. It's so critical. So anything that gets in the way of that, obviously, if it's not something criminal, I say, let's, let's do it. I'm all for it. And I know that, that Jay and the people were there before us, uh, Deb, uh, did a great job in making sure that they expressed their opinions about voting, but it should be easier to vote. Uh, we should have voting on weekends if we have to, whatever it takes to get a person to express what this country really means. Uh, so I'm for anything that can get that done. Very good. Lauren, we'll finish off with you on this question. Thank you, Lynn. I think my colleagues have said it all, and I am 100% behind the Let Rhode Island Vote Act. I am a co-sponsor. I think it's, as I'm sitting here, I'm remembering where all these ideas came from that are in the bill. And it was because we were in a pandemic and we wanted to make sure that people could vote. And we did the best we could two years ago to really open up the voter system for mail ballots and to drop off boxes and uh, removing the notary and witness requirements. We did a lot of things that we were in an emergency to, to make it easy to vote. And they worked really well. They worked really well. There was a lot of concern that they weren't going to work and voting was up. So let's take those lessons we learned in the pandemic in 2020 and make them permanent. So yeah, I absolutely support let Rhode Island vote without a doubt. Okay. Our next question is a, a little bit simpler in, in its wording. Would you support loosening Coastal Resources Management Commission regulations to enable homeowners to protect their property from rising sea levels? would you support financial assistance to do so? For this question, we should go to, uh, I believe Deb. Okay. I'll start with you on this one. I know this one's near and dear to your heart. Yes, it is. I don't know how simple it is, <laughs> as you said, <laughs> uh, <laughs> to be honest. Well, the wording uh, of the question. The wording, right? <laughs> yes. I'd like to know the genesis of that, uh, to be honest. Uh, I can tell you that the <laughs> the um, the commission has learned a great deal. And Lauren, um, I'm very honored to have Lauren also on the study commission. You know, the CRMC began 1972, and they've done some phenomenal work with a very talented staff. Um, a lot has happened, though, in 50 years. You know, all of a sudden, when they're not just doing dredging and marinas, uh, but we now have offshore wind projects. We have four offshore wind projects uh, off Rhode Island and Mass next year alone. And we have to remember the CRMC's authority is three miles offshore, 200 feet 
inland. And it's always a balance between riparian rights of those with waterfront property and the preservation of the shoreline, which is the right of all Rhode Islanders, right? To walk and enjoy the shore. It's all part of our constitution, Article 1, Section 17. So it's a balance. Uh, I do believe the CRMC needs to become a state priority. Um, in many ways, they're woefully underfunded with $5 million a year, two and a half from the state, two and a half from the feds. Um, it operates uh, with only three enforcement officers. So there's a lot of work and change that needs to happen. And again, I would say it's a balance. You know, 70% of our Rhode Island coastline is type one and type two waters. And those are residential and uh, where docks are okay. So I'm asked to stop. Thank you. We have tough timer going tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Marvin, let's move to you for your response to that question. Thank you. Yeah, you do have a tough timer tonight. <laughs> that's, but that's there's only four of us. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I, I see it almost like that, but, but a little different. For me, it's a question of uh, should a property owner uh, have the right to protect their property uh, almost any way that they can? I mean, that's, I take it to the extreme. And if you live on, on the coast and you've got the means to do whatever you know you, you can to protect your property, I, I, I tend to say that's not a bad idea. But at the same time, I recognize that um, if you have that means, but others don't have that means, uh, now are we into city zoning changes and those sorts of things? I think it's a little bit more complicated than, than we might know having served on the zoning board in Newport for almost eight years. But I do think it's a good idea that uh, if you have the means to, to take care of your property in the CRMC, shouldn't stand in the way in the sense that I'm the state agency, or even if it was a national agency, that I will do this for you. Uh, I, I have a little bit of an issue with that part of it. But I do think that uh, we should at some way uh, be able to incentivize or to uh, fund some of the things that people want to do to protect uh, where they live. I, th I think it's their right to do so. Thank you. Lauren? Yeah, thank you, Lynn. I, I, I think that the legislature has not really paid enough attention to flooding and the risk that it's going to present to property owners, to municipalities, their tax bases. I think that, uh, you know, again, with the passage of Act on Climate and the 85% of Rhode Islanders that want to do something on climate change, I'm optimistic that we can really start talking about flooding now and the resources that may be available. I'm I concerned that, you know, whatever homeowners might do to their property doesn't have a negative impact, you know, because the coast knows no boundaries. So the water comes up. And I think that there's a lot of design questions about how we would allow or encourage individual property owners to protect their property. I think that's a pretty big question. I, I also hope to uh, work a little bit on flooding this year. I have had the idea for years to introduce a flood audit program, which looks like the energy audit program, because we really need to get a handle on exactly what flooding is about. We need to give information to homeowners before they can make these kinds of decisions. So my take on it is, I'm not sure this is the right remedy right now. And I think we need to get more information into the hands of both homeowners and businesses along the coast so that we can begin working toward shoring up our coastline and coastal properties. The time has come. Thank you, literally. <laughs> uh, last to respond on this one would be uh, Jay. Yeah, this is by far your most difficult question. Uh, as Deb alluded to, this is really a double-edged sword. Number one, we have uh, homeowners in areas, I mean, I have in my own district, uh, there's an area in Charlestown where we actually constructed a house that's up 14 feet on piers. And there were, and it's, that, there's a road that runs along it. The road is at the waterline. 50 years ago, there were three other full streets full of houses in front of where this whole property is. So, I mean, just regular coastal erosion has really taken a toll on this entire area. I have areas uh, in Island Park where houses are well below um, where they should be. They're well below the, uh, the critical point. And they're also in what we call in, in the construction industry, the influence zone. I mean, they're gonna be heavily impacted by water and by, um, by wind. So I think one of the things we should look at what other states have done 
is possibly have the state go in and purchase some of these properties, get these properties out of there. Because the, what's going to happen, like the Island Park area and during the 38 hurricane, the entire area was devastated. We lost hundreds of people. And what happened? People went back, they rebuilt. 54 hurricane came around. We had the exact same issue. The, the, the Island Park area is has southern exposure and is prone to the influence of heavy wind, heavy water. And the problem was, is that it will, it'll just take the entire brunt of a bad storm. Thank you. For these last couple of questions, um, how about if we kind of reverse the order so that you're not always speaking after the, after the exact same person. And I'd like to um, begin with directing the question to Jeb first. Given the real possibility that Roe versus Wade will be overturned by the Supreme Court, do you favor passing the Equality in Abortion Act? So we'll do Deb and then Jay. Sure, thanks, Lynn. And the answer is yes. I'm actually a co-sponsor. It's a matter of fairness and equity. You know, this adds coverage to those in the state Medicaid program. It mostly impacts people who have low to moderate incomes, people of color, and those who can least afford a pregnancy yet they don't have the financial resources. I would also say I'm really proud that Rhode Island passed the Reproductive Privacy Act in 2019. That's a law that was a critical backstop in this state, knowing that the rights of women to provide their own healthcare decisions to a safe legal abortion, it was at risk in this country. And everyone said, oh, no, Roe v. Wade is the law of the land. Well, that is under threat at the U.S. Supreme Court right now. So thankfully, Rhode Island was perspicacious in passing that law so that women have the right to their own health care decisions. The government should not be in our bedrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, we'll go to you next on this one. Totally echo what Deb said. I am also a co-sponsor of this legislate legislation. Um, when the Reproductive Rights Act went through, I was the uh, deciding vote in the House Judiciary Committee. So I stand mm -hmm. behind women's right to choose what's best for their own bodies. And this bill will actually allow people who don't have the means to, to get the health care that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Lauren, to you. You're on mute. Stop. I agree with my two colleagues. I'm a yes. I co-sponsored it. Uh, we have to do this. It shouldn't be based on your economics and your pocketbook, whether or not you have access. Thank you. Marvin, to you. Yeah, I think I'm the only one left on that. Look, I, I'm, I'm a male and uh, I should not be, um, I should not be in the position or I should not have the mindset that I'm going to uh, dictate to a woman what she should or should not do with her body. This is a very divisive topic, like a lot of things that we deal with. But I absolutely think that that is a decision that should be made between uh, a, a woman, her, her uh, support system, her medical system, a number of things. And it affects so many people uh, who are not able to uh, you know, have a procedure or even have just a normal care done that other people can. So it's so much disparity in it that I, I, I'm, I absolutely support a woman's right to choose, uh, and, and more because uh, it's it's the right thing to do uh, from a, from a male's perspective. And I know that this causes a lot of angst among people, and probably in some ways it should. But you have to make a stand on something, and I, and I agree with my colleagues on that. Thank you very much to all of you for your for your input on that important question. The last question uh, regarding civics education is going to be started with Jay. And here is the complete question. Given the current lawsuits put forth by a group of Providence students arguing that Rhode Island schools are not giving them the civics background and the possibility that Supreme Court will uphold the denial of their lawsuit. Do you support legislation or curriculum revisions that would strengthen civic education in Rhode Island schools, including teacher training and creating statewide criteria and standards of proficiency? Please elaborate on a yes or no type question of this. Again, an emphatic yes. yes. 
I mean, I am a product of both public and private schools. I was fortunate to have teachers who were very civically minded, uh, who taught us well. And I think one of the reasons why I'm actually in the General Assembly is because of what they taught me. I have a political science degree from Northeastern that only uh, brought me forward uh, to be more civically in, in, involved. If we want the next generation to take over, take their rightful place, we need them to be able to do it and do it with knowledge and do it from a base where they actually know what's going on. We have had people in our Congress, we've had people who are, were president who didn't understand how legislation is done. They don't understand how a bill gets passed. And that's just wrong. All four of us know that it is not easy to be in government. It is not easy to run in government. It's not easy to run and get elected. But the more people who actually have a background in it, who understand the process, we allow more people to become involved and we'll have a more democratic society. Thank you. Lauren, we'll go to you next. Well, I quite frankly, I was a little confused with this question because we did pass H5028 last session, which does requ that which requires public schools to demonstrate proficiency in civics education and requires public schools to create programs. And right now, the uh, RIDE, the Rhode Island Department of Education, is promulgating rules to create a civic curriculum. So that does seem to be coming. The only thing that's not in the bill that was in your question was around the teacher training. And so that's kind of an interesting idea that maybe we'll follow. Sometimes we you know, take a bite out of the apple and then go back and improve it over time. So I want the viewers to know that we are working on civics education, you know, that that is happening. Um, and I'm a, I'm a big advocate of being a mentor and a supporter of young folks coming into the system. The, you know, I've always taken on interns, whatever it takes, because Jay's right. We really need to provide some leadership and be role models for younger people that want to come in the system. We all have a responsibility to do that. So yeah, I was a co-sponsor of that bill several years, and I'm proud to say that we're on the track to get that started. Thank you, Lauren. Marvin? Thank you much. Uh, for, for two years of the experience I've had uh, being a state legislator, I worked with the Council of State Governments, and we worked on a project that had specifically to do with, uh, with civic education uh, in this country. And it's not just here in Rhode Island, but in many, many territories and many states, uh, this question comes up. It is absolutely critical that you understand the government, which is divided, which is with this, you know, getting you to understand how your government works. If you don't understand how it works, then you can fall prey to a lot of things that, that are just wrong or don't make sense. Uh, so understanding, as Jay was saying, what it's like to be in public service and why we need people of all colors, all sexes, all everything to be part of government, it's so critical. If you learn that early in your educational career, it, it, in, it incentivizes you to continue to learn more about what the United States is all about. It is very different from a lot of other countries. And so without that educational part of it, uh, whatever it is in each state, and I know we'll have 50 different things out, but without that, we have no idea how this country really, really works, which is why some of the questions that we're getting surprises me because uh, uh, if, you, if you understood that, you would know that we work under systems, not just one person. But civics will teach you all about that. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm really you. far. Thank you. And Deb. Uh, Thank you. And I'm delighted that my colleague mentioned that we passed legislation uh, for civics education. Sometimes people don't realize what the General Assembly has done. So it's really important that you know that RIDE is working on this. So yes, emphatically, I co-sponsored it and voted for it. I also think financial literacy as well as civics education is really important um, in our schools. And I'll tell you one thing that I love doing are mock sessions. I take my, I have James 
Jamestown and Middletown and take the eighth graders in to the House of Representatives. I work with the, the teachers and we come up with, you know, bills and then they debate it on the House floor. They stand up and use the microphone. And every year, our first bill is no school on Friday. Now, wouldn't you think that legislation would pass Every year it fails, emphatically no, because the students start to say, well, wait a second, I do sports in the afternoon. My parents, what are they gonna do all day Friday if I'm home? It never passes. So they get to see firsthand how the process works. They also go on a tour of the state house and they see wonderful things like the 1663 Royal Charter that we have from King Charles II that granted Rhode Island its religious freedom. The state used that document until we passed our state constitution in 1843. I mean, these are the kinds of things that are so important in civics. So the most important office, and don't cut me off yet, the most important <laughs> office, the one in which all of us can and should fill is that of private citizen. Thank you. Now you can cut me off. Because <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. You bet. <laughs> um, we really appreciate everyone's thoughtful comments, and we know how busy you are and everything. And uh, we wanted to be sure that the forum didn't go too long in length um, nope. for your schedules, but also for for the viewers at home too. But since we do have a little bit of extra time for the uh, closing statements, let's go up to two minutes if, if you would like to, uh, if you made any notes or, or anything that you'd like to expand on, we would really appreciate it. Um, I'll just ask for a volunteer who'd like to go first. How's that? Well, I'll go first. I, I rarely volunteer for anything because Jay won't let me on the floor, but I will, <laughs> I'll do it now. Now, listen, thank you so much for the opportunity to have a chance to speak directly to our friends and citizens uh, out there and each other. We learn a lot from it because we do that. As you know, my main concern, and I think most people have, have given theirs, and main responsibility is that of our budget. You know, uh, legislators, bodies around the country exist basically for one or two reasons, but Expending public funds is one of them. And I got to say that I am so proud of the group of, of us, uh, legislators from East Bay that I work with because our, our budget is that thick and in it are the, the things that matter to, to individuals who can't do a lot of things for themselves. Uh, but this year, hopefully, uh, we're going to get, we will, I know we will get around to making sure because they're part of our priorities are to take care of our children. Uh, and, and our families who've been devastated so much under this, this COVID-19 stuff. Uh, you hear people talk about small businesses all of the time. Well, we're gonna do something about that. We've already been doing something about it, but that's got to be a high priority of ours. Uh, and you've heard it talked about the most things that I hear in Rhode Island is, wow, the price of houses is so high, I can't get mm -hmm. one. Well, we've, we do have a housing czar now and we're gonna be watching them like a hawk to make sure that over a period of time, uh, we will build out uh, a good scheme so that we will, we will be marketable and that people will be able to have affordable housing. Uh, and uh, Deb's favorite thing is the broadband. You know, a lot of kids are at home now uh, during the, the COVID stuff. And if you don't have good broad with, uh, broadband to get onto the net to learn, it's very difficult. That last mile is so critical to getting into the houses of those of us who, uh, who need them. And finally, we got to take care of our hospitality industry uh, and our early intervention. We had a lot of things about how great it is to make sure the kids are, are taken care of early. So all of that is on, this, is on the drawing board and we're going to get it done. Thank you, Marvin. Lauren, did you raise your hand? Would you like to go next? Uh, oh. Thank you for this opportunity. It's always a pleasure to meet with the League of Women Voters and to share the to share this time with my colleagues. I don't know who wrote these questions, but I think our answers were pretty much on top of all your questions. So I think that uh, the viewers sh should be pretty happy with uh, the, this group of East Bay legislators. Um, I, I think that Marvin is right. The East Bay legislators are becoming a, a, a strong block. We work together 
you'll probably see more of that when you meet with our colleagues from the northern part of uh, Newport County next week. We are working increasingly as a team uh, from Aquidneck Island, uh, as well as from the Tiverton and into Bristol and Warren. You know, we're on top of the issues that people care about down here, climate, broadband, beach access, CRMC, voting, choice. These are the things that uh, folks in this area of Rhode Island care about. And I hope that's apparent to your viewers that we are working on those things and we're all available to, what, to, to hear what people wanna bring other issues to our attention. Uh, you know, I know I am, I know my colleagues here on this call are. So I wanna thank you for this opportunity and uh, maybe check back with us in about three or four months when the rubber really hits the road and we actually start voting on stuff. So that's <laughs> when the real fun starts. So thanks a lot everybody and have a good evening. Good. Deb, I see you uh, sure. kind of getting ready there. I want to thank you. I love the work that the League of Women Voters do. And even just the framing of your questions shows how you care deeply about so many of these policy issues. And I would echo what my colleague said. You know, we have such a great group of elected reps and senators on Aquidneck Island and in East Bay. And I hope people watching sees how much we care deeply about the issues and how much we care deeply about your concerns as our constituents. Um, everyone's talking about broadband. You know, the feds did what the Senate wouldn't pass, but now we all are going to have a strategic plan in Rhode Island because every state has to have one in order to access a minimum of $100 million. Here in uh, Aquidneck Island, you know, we have some well, we're part of 42% are underserved and we've seen it with businesses and residents. So how we use those federal funds, really, really important. You know, um, I put in a bill for a broadband advisory council only because we need oversight and transparency in public interest. We have to make sure we're looking at innovation and technologies that will take us to the next 20, 30 years. And we're not just cementing old technologies that'll have to be replaced in three to five years. And you've heard um, the, the question, so you care about choice, you care about voting, you care about the economy, our coastline, all of us care deeply about those issues. And I know my colleagues, and I'm so honored to work with these three people, I'd walk through that wall for them because they care deeply and we work as a team. So thank you for the opportunity and um, thank you for the work you do and um, appreciate it. And I not only see us in three months, but see us in six months when we're trying to run for re-election. <laughs> Stay well, ciao. New, Newport this week will probably return with their candidate, with our candidate forum. So we'll be seeing more of you, I, I promise. And I know uh, the League of Women Voters feels very strongly that the issues are important too, that we might just do, do this again in a few months. Thank you. Jay, we need oh, a you know, I never, from you. I almost never get to have the last word, but I get it tonight. So <laughs> I, I am, like my colleagues, I am very proud to be a member of the East Bay delegation. I, I think the East Bay has been overlooked for years. Um, I think that with the group of legislators who have come into the East Bay, they are such hardworking folks they work really hard in their legislation. They work really hard in their causes. And they think they do the best they possibly can for all of their constituents. And it makes me really proud to be one of those members. Um, I know that with the, the three of us, the three other people here, um, the four of us together, I know we will work a lot together. We work very cohesively and we work for what is best for the entire East Bay. And these people don't forget that Tiverton is still a part of Rhode Island, which is really important <laughs> to me. And with that, I will say thank you very much for having us on, on this forum. And I look forward to seeing you all in three or six months again. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, well, that concludes this evening's uh, forum. I want to remind any of our viewers that next week, East Bay Newspapers Media Group will be meeting with the other legislators and uh, recording their answers also. This, uh, the forum will be available through the Newport This Week website, Facebook, also the League of Women Voters, social media also, and encourage you uh, tomorrow, we'll send each of you the, um, the actual link so that it's easy for you to 
pass it along to uh, constituents or friends, anyone, because we we definitely want people to hear your your thoughtful answers and share in the valuable time that you gave us. So with that, again, thank you to everyone, the League of Women Voters. Thank you. And thank you to all of viewers. Thank you and thank good, you, night. Good, night. Thank you, good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Ciao. Au